into the problem of the day, only because it's sequentially, we, we didn't quite finish the uh, section on priority queues. And there is something very important to, um, you know, about, let's say, data structures that I want to say, now that everybody's slithering in, maybe I will wait a, uh, another couple of minutes to say it then. Um, tell you what. Let's go, okay, you've convinced me. Everybody's so late. They convinced me to go to the problem of the day first. Okay. This will teach you guys to come in on time. Uh, let's try full page. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get started. I wanted to talk to you about uh, the, the problem of the day. Let's start with the problem of the day now, because the stuff on priority queue is even more important. I want to make sure nobody misses it. But last time we started talking about heaps. And um, the heaps, uh, here's a problem about heaps. It said, suppose I am given a heap on n elements and a real number, x, Determine if the kth smallest item in the heap is less than or equal to x. Question. This is not the problem of the day that was due today. What is the problem of the day that was due today? Two sets that were disjoint sets. Everybody agrees with that. OK, so let's talk about the problem of the day. This is actually kind of going to be an interesting uh, class. So problem of the day. Everybody else knows the problem of the day but me. So what is the problem of the day? The problem of the day, it seems, was you're given two sets. One has n elements. One has m elements. Is n bigger than m? Which is bigger? What? It said that n was like probably greater than or it doesn't say, but one issue that is certainly true is either n is n is greater than or equal to m. If not, we reverse n and m. Does everybody agree with that? We have a potentially big set and a potentially little set. And the question is what? What do we want to do with these sets? Determine if the sets are disjoint. So we have the set 1, 4, and 7. And 3, 8, and 19. And let's say 21, because these things are just. Are these sets disjoint? Yes. OK. If we have put in a, a, a 4 in here, they're no longer disjoint. OK. Can we come up with an algorithm? Someone give me an algorithm to test whether these two sets are disjoint. Yes. OK, so what you're saying here is you're saying sort the first set. How much time would that take? N log n. Sort the second set, right? How much time will that take? Now that they're sorted, what are you going to do to see if they're identical? You're going to basically walk through these things, right? Is this the same as that one? No. Well, the smaller one, maybe we'll delete the smaller one. Is this the same as that one? No, is this the same as ding, 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 right? That's basically what you're doing, something like that. OK? So we believe that this plus an extra O of n, O of what? n plus m, right? Once they're sorted and I'm linear in the, the size of the sets, I can walk through that. Does everybody agree with that? So this is an algorithm. What is the complexity of this algorithm? I see it's order n log n plus m log m plus n plus m. Let's simplify that, right? How would I simplify that? What, what's the easiest thing to make go away? Well, I say m, n is clearly less than n log n, right? So certainly the additive n is uninteresting. m is clearly less than m log m, right? The additive m is uninteresting. If we know that n is less than m, which is what we're sort of assuming here, what does this work out to? 
okay? I claim that this works out too, okay? If m is bigger than n, this goes away. Does everybody agree with that? So is this a good algorithm or a bad algorithm? Oh, okay, good, bad, I don't know. It's an algorithm, okay? One way to say, may say it's a bad algorithm is to show me a better algorithm. Is there a better algorithm for this problem? You want to say something. So what you want to do is instead, let's take a look at this. Option number two. Maybe I'll even try to erase it. Boom. Still the case that n is less than m, right? Um, what your option is now, what you want to do is to sort which set? Sort the small set. That's going to take n log n. Does everybody agree with that? Now what do you want to do with the elements of the second set? For each one of these guys in the big set, say R is there. Does everybody agree with that? So what does that work out to? That would be how much? We're doing m times log n. Does everybody see that? So I think the algorithm here that is being proposed, before we had what? m log m? Does everybody agree with that? Now what do we have? n log n plus m log n. Which is the bigger of these two? m log n, does everybody agree with that? m log n, which is better? OK, let's look at this thing now. This one is now better than that. Does everybody agree with that? Do people see that in principle, this one is now better than that? OK, if one set is very small, let's think about it. Suppose that one set had one element in it and the other had m elements in it. This is going to be m log m. This is going to be what? If n was 1, order m. Does everybody see what that would, would be? Actually, wait a second. Yes, does everybody see that? OK, that if m was 1, n was 1, and m was big, this algorithm would have the property that this is going to be linear now. Does everybody agree with that? If n was so small as to be a constant, OK? And if m was, n was as big as m, which is the best it could be, then basically they would be the same. Any questions? Is there any other options we can use to find which one is bigger, which set, whether the sets are disjoint? You sorted the small one. Is there something else we could do? We could sort the big one, right? And do the same kind of binary search, right? What would that one be? Sort the big one would be what? M log M. And then do the binary searches. What would the binary searches be? N log M. Does everybody agree with that? Now, which would be better? n log m or m log n? Let's think about it. If these were the two choices that we had, which would be better? n log m seems to be much better, right? Again, suppose m was of constant size. n was of constant size and m was big, right? This would be what in that way? If n was constant, it would be a log m algorithm, right? What's the catch? That's not the total part of the work, right? We had to pay for the total amount. What is n log m plus n log m? What is that going to be when we add it up? n log m, it's no better than the first sorting one, sorting both. Does everybody agree with that? So the interesting thing is there is one option that is better than the other. OK? Any questions about that? OK? 
So even though it's in some sense a simple question, still, how you use sorting and searching, there is room for subtlety. Any question? Enough subtlety that I apparently got this wrong as the problem of the day. So this is the problem of the day. Does everybody agree? Okay, sorry about that. Any questions? Okay. What I would like to talk about now uh, is, let's come back here. This is not the, the one that I want to talk about. Um, excuse me, sorry about that. Okay. What I'd like to start talking about, if I can, is finish up talking about uh, some notes from the end of last lecture on priority queues. Because it's important when you think about algorithms. There's certain things that are um, simple, so simple that they might be ignored but are really somehow very important to think. There's a lot of things in algebra that are hard. I flashed up a lot of algebra in here. You're going to get nervous. But there's relatively simple things that are important. And because they look simple, they get overlooked and you don't think about them. One thing to be aware of, very, it's very, very important, is what a priority queue is and um, what a priority queue might do for you. Okay. So um, when I talk to people who aren't algorithms people, they come in, they say, I have a problem, I put it on a linked list, and this, and they're not talking my language, okay? I talk in terms of stacks, I talk in terms of queues, I talk in terms of dictionaries, and I talk in terms of priority queues. Priority queues are data structure, which um, in some sense are gonna be useful because they're gonna provide more flexibility than sorting, okay, on certain kinds of problems. Sorting, we have seen, is very, very useful. A priority queue is a job that is going to enable, a data structure is going to enable us to constantly get the, the, the smallest thing left in our system, okay? Allowing us to insert new things into our system. So a lot of these sorting algorithms work by you take the data, you sort it, and you go bop, bop, bop through it from biggest to smallest. If new things come in in the middle, somehow you've got to insert things into your sorted order, okay? And the, a priority queue is a data structure that does that kind of thing if you implement it efficiently. So a priority queue is basically a data structure that supports just three operations. Given a priority queue and a, a new item, insert it into the priority queue, okay? Find a min is an operation supported in a, in a pipe by the priority queue. Namely, given as input, okay, finding a, um, find the smallest item in the priority queue that is there. It may or may not support find maximum, okay? As we'll see when we build things like heaps, you guys learned about heaps or something like that. If the structure is ordered where the root is the smallest, finding the minimum element is easy. Finding the maximum element is not easy, right? Does everybody kind of get that idea? Now, you could have said if I was only interested in maximum, I could have returned the whole world around and put the maximums on the root, right? Conceptually, there's not a difference between finding the minimum or finding the maximum, but you only really the data structure really only supports one of those options, okay? You can have either this or that, but you don't get both, is the way I think of what a priority queue does. Any questions? Okay. It's like saying, is it interesting to sort in increasing order or decreasing order? You sort it one way. Any questions? The other thing you can do is to delete the minimum or the maximum. Okay. Delete, again, we'll talk about only on one side, delete the minimum is the other operation. You can tell me what is the minimum element and then delete the minimum element from it. Or you can insert a new item in. Those are the three operations that a priority queue does. Any questions? Does everybody agree that these three operations could be done in log n time with a balanced binary search trick? How would we do an insert in a balanced binary search tree? If it, we were using a balanced binary search tree as our priority queue, or it means insert, right? Log n. Find minimum, 
Bop down the left pointers, right? Does everybody agree with that? Log time proportional to the height logarithmic. How would you do delete minimum from the data structure in log n time? Okay, suppose I want to have binary search trees do not have a built-in operation, delete the minimum. How would you delete the minimum? Yeah? You do find minimum. Now that I got a pointer to it, delete, right? Log n plus log n is log n. Does everybody agree that all three of these can be supported easily using binary balanced binary trees in log n time? Okay? Last class, we talked about heaps. Can these things be supported in log n time on heaps? OK, heap data structures. And my claim is yes. Let's think about what we did if we remember what a heap is. How do you find a minimum in a heap? Root. That took order one time, right? Easy. How did we insert a new item into a heap? Does anyone remember? What did we do to insert a new item in a heap? We found, we, we, we looked at the bottom of the array, added one to, in the slot next to the last element, and bubbled it up. Everybody agree with that? Insert took time, order log n, right? How would we delete the minimum in a heap in logarithmic time? Where is the minimum? How would we delete the minimum efficiently? What was the idea there? Find the last element in our array, put it at the root, overwrite what is at the root, delete one from the number of elements we have in the heap, and then bubble this guy down. Remember that? Does that make sense? That took logarithmic time, OK? So when I think priority queues, I usually think heaps, OK? Although it's important to think in the abstract data type world, where we're talking about what the operations actually are, OK? I think in terms of these operations, and I know I can program a heap and do them if I need to. Any questions? Questions? How would I delete the minimum item in a heap? The root is a minimum. What would I do? to delete the minimum item from the heap, what I would do is I would say, if I delete it, something's got to replace it, right? No. What I would do is, you might say, move things up. Your thinking is I could fill it in by moving things up. The trouble is that's going to create a hole someplace, right? If everybody moves up, somebody is going to get a hole made, right? And I don't want any holes in my heap. So what am I going to do? I'm going to announce to the lowest ranking guy, suddenly you are at the top of the heap. OK, you're the leader. See if you can hold that position. OK, but you probably can't hold that position, right? It's now going to say, we're going to slide it down, find out which is the bit smallest, this, this, or this. The winner goes to the top, the loser marches down one level. And the interesting thing is now this element is going to march down. And we can restore the heap property without creating any holes. Does everybody agree with that? If we just moved up the elements, there would be a hole created someplace in our heap, right? And we don't know where that is. We want the hole to be at the last spot in our array, so it isn't really a hole, right? And I claim this means of moving it there and sliding it down doesn't create a hole. Any questions about that? OK. So that, I think, is interesting. So heaps can do all of these things in log n time. So heaps are my favorite priority queue, is one way to think about it. Any questions? The bigger thing to think about, though, is that why do I have a favorite priority queue? OK. The reason is because priority queues are very, very important for programs around. So me as an algorithms person, I will say often, I will organize my world around a priority queue. Certain applications naturally are suggestive of priority queues. What is an application? I know I have something queued on the board, OK? But before I get to the board, 
What is an application? Can anybody think of any applications where priority queues are a data structure that naturally arises in computer systems? Okay. The airline reservations, it's not going to mean what airline reservations are. What is the priority there? So one possibility is if there is a waiting list for people to do something, a queue of people. Well, if it's first come, first serve waiting list, a waiting list at a bank is not a priority queue, right? We can just use a, first, a FIFO queue for that, right? So one possibility is that if you're, um, I would say probably not so much an airline thing, but at a nightclub. You guys, OK, I have this image of people hanging out in New York nightclubs where there's this big bouncer sitting there at the velvet rope, OK? Skeena comes by, dressed like this. They say, well, if we can't fill up the club, maybe, OK? Someone who's, who's, who's better looking or more important goes in. Do people see that? Or that one person at a time through the door. They're choosing from the mob that is out there. Who is the most desirable one to get in? Does everybody agree with that? A refrigerator. OK, so you're saying is a refrigerator modeled as a priority queue. You could say that if you're, I said I was, if you're retrieving food based on what's the most desirable food in there, okay? Occasionally you shop and buy more food and it goes into the refrigerator. You're hungry, you open the door out. What is the most desirable food, right? If there's a total order on food desirability, not that you sometimes want something else. Real in a different mood, different days, it's not a priority queue, right? But if the food is ranked from most desirable to least desirable, then a refrigerator would be modeled by a priority queue. Does everybody see that? Where in real computer systems are there priority queues? Okay. Processor scheduling, right? On any computer, a modern computer is a multi-processing system, right? There are multiple processes running, fighting for the CPU at any given time. What happens? The system says, what is the most highest priority job to run? It takes it off the priority queue, gives it a shot of computation, a certain number of uh, seconds to run. Then it sticks it back in the priority queue, saying, well, you're happier now. I gave you some computation. I'll insert you in with a lower priority, right? If you have a really important process, you'll keep a high priority. If you're a lowly process, you get a low priority, only if we get adherence to it. Do people see that priorities in operating systems, scheduling things, are run by priority queues? Any questions about that? So once you start to look at them and think about them, a lot of things in life are governed by priority queues. Again, I have a silly example here. I guess yesterday was Valentine's Day. So this is the Valentine's Day example, OK? Suppose you are trying to maintain a database of people, possible people you can ask out for a day. OK? What is the way this database should be organized? You might say the data structure is a dictionary. I want to be able to look somebody up by name, right? But if you're dating in some sense, I say you're not interested in looking people up by name so much as you're looking up who is the most interesting person that I can ask out next time, right? That the world is full of people, OK? And each person has an interestingness level. This person is an 8, 7.5, a 9.2, OK? What is, should in some sense be the basic iteration of, about asking people out? The algorithm is probably something like, wall not marry. OK, so you're dating. What is the basic idea? OK? It should probably be sort of get me the min. So D is equal to the min in the priority queue. Does everybody agree with that? That's the best person there. What should I now do? I should now do a date D, OK? And I'm going to reevaluate them after a date. Isn't that probably what happens? OK, you look at them. Maybe they seem nicer. You like them. OK, that's good. Maybe you discovered they're not so good. You lower their priority, right? So then it would be insert D with new priority. Does everybody see that? What other event is happening? Did I meet anyone new? 
If I met somebody new, what should I do with them? Judge, make some judgment of their desirability and insert them in the priority queue, right? Does everybody see that? The basic loop here is retrieving people by priority, okay? Any questions about that example? Is that clear, okay? Fair enough. Might be a little silly, but, uh, but the basic idea, the point is a lot of things in life are governed by priority queues. When you write simulations, okay, um, a lot of time goes into, um, what you call it, modeling events that are happening in a simulation, okay? That, uh, you know, you want to simulate uh, what people are doing. You might predict what time is someone going to be born, when is someone going to die, when is someone going to do something. There are all these events of interest in your simulation. You compute these events in advance or, you know, at some point, compute them. You stick them into the priority queue. The, the, the queue is ordered, the events are ordered by time. What is the next thing I should do in a simulation? Okay? A lot of simulations work down to these kind of things. Stick things in a priority queue. Any questions? Another thing that comes up in algorithm design, this one is now a serious algorithm design like we might do in here, is that sometimes you, we have what you would call a greedy algorithm. Like let's say when we're talking about traveling salesmen, right? What did we do in the traveling salesman heuristic? You guys had some kind of an idea that, well, we were going to pick which pair of points were closest, right? And merge those two, add an edge between them, and keep connecting pairs of points that are closest until everything's connected, right? Somehow you want a, a data structure that will repeatedly tell you what's the next smallest thing. What's the next smallest thing, right? That is the kind of thing you use a priority queue for, okay? And thinking and recognizing this is an important part of algorithm. When is there a priority queue? Because then something like a heap is the right data structure, okay? And it gives you the right way to think about it. Any questions? One of the war stories in the books Okay, in the book, it talks about sequential strips and triangulation. And this is one where the key idea was to basically use a priority queue. Okay, so I encourage you to read that and see it. Okay, any questions? If you can become fluent with priority queues, you will be a hero someday. Okay, any question about that? Okay, it'll make your life much easier, and hopefully somebody else's too. Any questions? Okay, well, that's about priority queues. I think that's all I have to say here. Okay? Any questions? Questions? Ah, so I was talking last class about, um, first of all, there's an index, so hopefully you can find it in the index. But I talked about priorities a little bit in the, in the section on data structures. But in the book, we talked about heaps. We sort of just finished talking about heap sorts. There is no index in your book, okay? Then you can't find it in the index in the book. When the full edition comes out, you can find it in the index. But it's not, I'm sorry, uh, that I'm sorry about, okay? Um, that said, the, you should probably use the, um, what you call it? The, um, the, the section on heap sorts is sort of an introduce in chapter four is the excuse to talk about heaps. And so I talk a little bit about it there. I also talk in data structures about priority queues, okay? So you should look at those sections. Any questions? So I will apologize for that. Let's now set up, uh, let's move on and talk here about um, let's look, full view, full screen, boom. OK, so we've been talking here about efficient data structures for sorting. And um, one reason for talking about it is to introduce you to um, you know, different ideas in, 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 in algorithms are explained sort of by different sorting ones, different, different sorting algorithms. Merge sort is an algorithm that um, is sort of a canonical example of what we would call a divide and conquer algorithm. It's a divide and conquer recursive algorithm for sorting, okay? And um, recursive algorithms work as you know, recursion is taking a problem and bringing it into smaller problems to solve. 
We usually think of that in terms of um, trying to solve something correctly. But um, exactly how you break it up into, into smaller problems makes a difference. Now, um, a way that leads to very efficient algorithms is if you can take your problem, break it into two half problems, so they're two much smaller problems, solve them independently, and then combine the answer to give you the answer that you want. Okay? If you can do that, that gives you a fast algorithm. That's a, a pro algorithm design approach called divide and conquer. Okay, and let's look at a particular example of it. The problem of merge sort. People here have seen merge sort before. We have never seen merge sort. Okay, everyone's seen it, most everyone's seen it. The idea of merge sort is you are given as input a, an array or a list of items to sort. Seven, uh, four, 19, uh, three. You break it into two subproblems. You magically sort the subproblems. One through seven, sort to one through seven. Four, 17, three, rows three, four, 17. And now that they are sorted, you combine them. How can we combine the two sorted lists? Okay, if I give you two sets of data, how do you combine it? Okay, we sort of did something like that in the problem of the day, right? How would you do it? Find the smallest of the two of them, right? Does everybody agree with that? So the smallest, I give a pointer to the head of the both of them. If these lists are sorted, where is the smallest element? It's got to be at the beginning of the list, right? The smaller of the two tops has to be the smallest one overall. Does everybody agree with that? So one is the smallest overall. We delete it from this and move our finger over, right? Which is bigger, this one or this one? Two is the small one, right? Two is the one that should go next. Write it down, move our finger over. Which is bigger, three or seven? Which is smaller, I guess, three or seven? Three. Move the finger over. Four or seven? Four. Four or 17? I mean, uh, seven or 17? Seven. Nothing or, well, 17, right? If I give you a list here with n over two elements and a list here with n over two elements, how much time does it take to merge them by this procedure? n. Why is it order n? The way I think about it is, in each round, I am spending constant amount of time to put one more answer in sorted order, right? So n times O of 1 is n. Does everybody agree? see that? That's how I think of it, OK? So what is interesting here is that merge sort is very nice in the fact that I have, it is easy for me to divide the problem of sorting an array into two pieces. Namely, give the first half of the pieces to one recursive call, the second half of the pieces to the other one. Here I'm only specifying by the index in my array, from one to n, initially. So I find the middle element from one to the middle, then the middle plus one to the n. Once I have them, merge the two subarrays. Okay, any questions? How much time will it take to sort these things? Okay, it's, any questions here? Is this obvious from looking at this? Okay, any guesses from this about what the time complexity should be or why? Can we look at this and looking at the program, can we tell anything? Yeah? N log N, why? Because you look at the program or you know something? So the idea of doubling things. So one thing you can catch a whiff of a log, maybe, because I'm cutting things in half, right? Cutting things in half is a good way to get logs somehow, OK? 
But I think we need a different way to view it. I couldn't look at this and get that idea. Okay? Any questions? I have to look at this in a more complicated way to figure out how much time this is going to take. Any questions? The way I would look at it is sort of taking a look. Again, here's an example of merge sort. What is merge sort going to do? It breaks the problem up. Let's think about it. Suppose we want to sort the letters in the word merge sort. How would we do it? We break the problem into two parts, right? And then we start working recursively on merge. We break it on two parts. Break it on two parts. Now it's down to one element, right? That's sorted, right? So we now know this half is sorted. The E is one element. This half is sorted. Everybody agree with that? Merge it. And now this is what's returned from this merge sort, right? The thing that called it here was this. This half is easy to sort. It's just one chunk. Then it's merge, E, M, and R. And that's what I get, right? Now I have to merge sort G, E. Again, I call it, I'm going to get single element, single element, merged, E, G. Now I have to merge this part with that part. I get this. People see the flow of the algorithm, how it's actually going? It's important to be able to trace through the recursion and see what's going on. Sort, merge sort S, O. Merge sort S, done. Merge sort O, done. Merge, O, S. Sort R, T, R, done. T, done, merge. Merge O, S, and R, T, get this. Merge this and this, and get this. Any questions? If you see this, one thing you will get the idea of, where is there a log here? Does anybody see a log now? What? You're saying the first half there is a log. What is the log? It's the height of the first half? Where is the log? Does anybody see a log? In each case, the size of my pieces is cutting cut in half, right? Here I have pieces of size n, n over 2, n over 4, dot, 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 down to 1, right? How many times will I, can I have it till I get down to 1? Log n. Does everybody agree that that heated tree is of height log n? And what about this other thing on the bottom? How big is that? Same, it's just look if I look at it in the mirror, right? It's part of the same end of the call. It's the input, that's the output. Log n. What would two things of log n be? Log n plus log n, what's that? Log n, okay? So it's clear the height of this thing is log n. Any questions? Okay, as we said before, we talked about it. We can merge two lists in linear time basically by the discussion we had before. Everybody agrees with that, right? Any questions? Um, actually, before I get too far ahead, what is then the, the running time of this? OK? We sort of agree now that the total amount of work done is, it results in a tree of height log n. How much total work is done? OK? How can we count up the total amount of work? The way I would like to count it up is say, how much work is done on each level? OK? Let's think what we're actually doing here. OK? Let's look at this last level. It's probably the easiest one to see. Where I have two parts of size n over 2 and n plus over n over 2 and n over 2, and I'm merging them. How much time did that take? To take two things of size n over 2 and n over 2 and merge the elements. How much time did that take? n. Does everybody see that? This took n steps, right? Now, suppose, let's look at the step above it. Here, if I have n over 2, n over 4, 
two elements total divided into two equal parts. This was n over four elements and n over four elements. How many steps does it take to move, merge n over four, two halves of n over, two n over four element lists? How much steps? I claim I'm going to be doing n over two things. Does everybody agree with that? Do people agree that it is half as much work to merge the thing, two things of size a quarter than it is to merge two things of size one half? Do people believe it's half as much work to do? How many people believe that? See why that is. How many people don't see why that is? Okay. Because why is it? Because the time it took was basically I'm doing n rounds to merge two things of size n over two. I'm doing n rounds of saying, am I bigger than you? Right? If I have half as many elements in each list, I'm doing half as many tests. Am I bigger than you? Does everybody agree with that? Because after each test, I'm outputting somebody in sorted order. So what's interesting? Here I've got n over 2 elements. Here I've also got n over 2 elements total, right? If this is half the work of this, and this is half the work of this, what's the total amount of work done in these merges? n. Does everybody see that? It's how I've sliced it and diced it. OK? Another way to say is it that I'm looking at each element. Well, for each element to move into the next list, then each element to move into the next list, I'm moving each element to the next list with one comparison. That's one way to look at it. Okay? Every element is getting moved to the next list eventually. That means there's a total of n comparisons. Actually a little bit less, okay? Turns out that you need n minus one comparisons for n things. Okay, But the important point here is that the total amount of work done in these merges is n. The total amount of these merges work in every level turns out to be n steps. How many people see that at each level it's going to be a linear amount of work? How many people see that? How many people don't see it? I want to see it. Okay. So what's good about that? If I am doing log n levels of work, and at each level I am doing a linear amount of work, how much total work am I doing? n log n. Does everybody see that? The n log n falls from thinking about the tree and thinking about where the work is being done. That's kind of the way that we think about it. Okay. I am accounting for every unit of work but I'm sort of grouping it in chunks that makes it easier for me to count how much was done. Any questions about that? Right? Let's think about the basic case where I have n over 2 lists. It's a case right up in the middle here. Here I've got n over 2 problems, each of which is merged one element with another element. Right? That's what the level is up here. OK? That's n over 2 steps, right? It's n steps, basically. Each level is n. Log n levels times n is n log n. Any questions about that? OK. So that's why merge sort is n log n. Any questions? OK. Now, what is a disadvantage of merge sort over heap sort? Heap sort we saw was n log n. Merge sort is n log n. Is there an advantage to one over the other? OK, who likes one better? OK, what? You like merge sort. Why do you like merge sort? You get it, because you understood it. OK, fine. That might be one reason. OK, any questions? Why would you like it? Why, what do you like better? Well, you like heap sort. Why do you like heap sort? 
You're saying it's not recursive. Actually, it is recursive if you stop and think about it. The data structure of moving bubble up and bubble down are recursive procedures. Okay? So that's not a good reason to like one over the other. Okay? Why do you, which one do you like? So one difference, substantive difference, between heap sort and merge sort have to do with how much extra memory you need, okay? With heap sort, you notice that we actually built the heap in, a in an array, and it didn't need any extra memory, right? Question, if I give you an array like the one that I gave you before, where let's say this is 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, and these were arrays. This was packed in an array. And I now ask you to merge the two lists. How would you merge the two lists? Like they're embedded in an array. Let's say they're embedded in an array. Which goes first, one or four? Where do I put one now? Oh, I could put it over here and overwrite four. What's the problem with this? I lost four. I could put four over here, but what, what do I now do? What, what, where does four come into the picture? It's not clear to me it does, right? How would you merge these two things easily with an array? Create an extra array. Now that every life is very easy, right? Four, five, six, one, two, three. Which is smaller? One. And I'll leave it there. There's no reason to harm it. Move my finger over. Which is smaller? Two or four? Two. Which is smaller? Three or four? Three. Hit the end. Four, five, six. You want it back in the array? Copy it over now. One, two, three, four, five, six. Does everybody agree with that? It still takes order n, okay? Right? Does, does everybody agree this is still an order n merge? The downside is you need the extra array, the extra buffer, okay? You don't mind having a buffer? This is good, okay? If the elements were linked lists, do you need an extra buffer if these are linked lists? Turns out, no, you just sort of show, you know, you, as, as you move down the list, you pop it on the, the new list of sorted things that you're making, right? So maybe for linked lists, buffer merge sort is very, very good, right? Does everybody agree with that? Convenient thing. Any questions? Okay, so that's really the big problem with it, is the buffering, or the big nuisance. On the other hand, what turns out to be a important use of merge sort has to do with the fact that many sorting problems are very, very big, okay? Let's say that your job was to produce the phone book. Your, who owns the phone book these days? It used to be Yellow Pages, Inc., okay? Whoever they are, okay? But somewhere they're gonna produce the Manhattan phone book, right? And one, sub, one part of producing the Manhattan phone book is sort everybody in Manhattan in alphabetical order and print them out, right? Does everybody agree with that? So they've got a big sorting problem. And there are much bigger pro sorting problems than the, the uh, Manhattan phone book. Can anyone think of a bigger pro sorting problem than the Manhattan phone book? Um, I would imagine that the US Census, I imagine that the uh, Tax people, who are the tax people? The IRS. They have a big sorting problem, undoubtedly. Everybody's mailing in, they're getting these 1099 data, right? Skeena earned a little bit of money here, okay? You, 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 you guys, when, you, when you guys get something, the government gets a sense of how much money you have. Some people sort all of that by your name, or really your, your taxpayer ID, right? So that, that they have that all together to figure out how much tax you owe. So clearly there are very, very large sorting problems in the world. Now, so big that the data doesn't fit in main memory, okay? What's the biggest computer with main memory you have ever heard of? I know you can buy one at the store, a 64-bit computer, a 32-bit computer does what? Two gigabytes, four gigabytes, you strain. You know, you're not gonna buy a machine, even 64, 
mega gigabyte machines are now out, right? Or a 64-bit machine can address more memory. But I've never heard of more than 128 gigabytes of memory on a machine. Probably there is one someplace. But that's pretty serious, right? But on the other hand, there's bigger sorting problems than that. So one important problem that's really where the bread and butter is if you're in the sorting industry is how do you sort things that are very, very big, so big that it doesn't fit in memory, OK? And here, the big problem is that your data, if it's not going to fit in memory, is going to get stored on a disk. And disks have weird properties to them, right? Disks are slower than main memory. So getting access to some data on a disk is slow, right? It has the property that, although it's slow to get access to the first thing, it's not so slow once you have it to get all the stuff after it, right? There's a lot of weird properties of disks. Bottom line, merge sort turns out to be a good thing if you program it right on disks. So the, the real big, fast, super sorting programs are variants of merge sort, OK, for reasons like that. Any questions about that? OK, so we'll give it its due. The other reason to have talked about merge sort is, again, as to illustrate a paradigm of algorithms that is very, very important called divide and conquer. Okay? What is the idea of divide and conquer? The idea is, if I can take my problem and divide it into two smaller problems, solve each recursively, Combine the answers to those subproblems into one problem, okay? Such that the combining is faster than solving the subproblem. In this case, what was it to take it? To sort in merge sort. To merge sort something of size n over 2 took what? n over 2 log n over 2, right? Or equivalently, n log n. Merge this sort the this half was n log n. But once we had those halves sorted, the merging was what? Was order n. Does everybody see that? The merging was faster than coming up with the uh, you know with, with, with actually solving the individual problems, right? If that is true. And you can divide into two co pro problems such that you can merge them. You get an efficient algorithm. OK? Any questions about that? Can anyone think of any other problems we've seen in here that are divide and conquer? One other one that people would usually call divide and conquer. What? No, convex hull, let's say no. OK? What about binary search? Let's think about binary search in this regard, right? I have an array of size n, right? I, give me the middle element, OK? Search this part and then this part, right? Does everybody agree with that? Here is the index element. Let's say I'm searching for 100. And the middle element was 50. The value was 50, OK? I now have to search. It's 100 is not 50. I have to search this part and this part. Searching to the left of it, how much? If I was looking for 100, how much time does it take me to search the stuff to the left of 50? That took zero, or I say order one. Right? How much time does it take to search to the right? Well, it's order log n, right? Does everybody agree with that? How much time does it take to combine the answers in some sense? This maybe is stretching it a little bit. If I know it's not, the, I, I get the answer, it's not in the left, and I get the answer, it is in the right. How much time does it take to combine it once I get the result of this search and this search? I would say constant, right? Find me if 100 is here. It's not here. It is here. Did you find it? Yeah, where was it? It was there. So in order one time, in some sense, I'm combining the results. Sort of a vague 
And I'm not sure I, I like that example so much. Okay? So, Start and Conquer is an important algorithm technique. I don't want to understate how important it is. Many famous algorithms, okay, that appear in, let's say, a more advanced algorithms class, turn out to be divide and conquer, okay? The FFT, the Fast Fourier Transform, some would argue this is the most fast, important algorithm in the world because this is what made image processing possible and music processing possible. Every time you listen to your iPod, you can thank somebody who did an F some FFT did not die in vain, okay? Because there was a lot of signal processing on that music. Um, that is done by divide and conquer. The fastest algorithms for multiplying matrices are divide and conquer. That said, I'm not going to talk about divide and conquer more in here because a lot of these algorithms are kind of complicated and I can't design them on scratch. Okay? So I like to teach the bread and butter thing. But you should be clear that this kind of a uh, design idea, when you see it, is a very good idea. Okay? Any questions? Sometimes heuristics are good for divide and conquer. Let's say you want to search for, for something. Let's say you, you're, you're searching, one of your friends is lost somewhere on campus. You have two people to do the searching. How do you divide, how do you help find your friend? What do you do? You take campus. Half of campus goes to one friend, your half goes here, right? Then you wander around looking for him. Then you come back and combine your answer. Yes, I found him. No, I didn't. Okay? If both of you say you found him, you got trouble, right? <laughs> Any questions about that? Okay? So it's clear that this is a good idea if you can, can, can make it work. Any questions? Any questions are all about merge sort. Okay? Why it's n log n, why it's a good thing. Okay? Fair enough. That said, um, I'd now like to spend um, a fair amount of time on a uh, algorithm that is another n log n algorithm for sorting although this is not going to be in the worst case, um, that in some ways looks a little bit like merge sort, okay? Um, namely, quick sort. The thing that is going to be most interesting about quick sort is not that it's quick, although it is a fast sorting algorithm, arguably the fastest sorting algorithm if you're sticking in memory. The thing that's going to be interesting about quick sort is the idea, okay? And that there's a lot of interesting ideas there's an interesting idea about um, why quicksort works well. Okay, that's important to understand. Sort of an idea of randomization. Okay, so let me start describing the idea of quicksort. Okay, the idea of quicksort is, as my basic step, I'm going to pick some element. If this is my array to be sorted. I'm going to pick some element, let's say the last one, and use that to throw the elements in the array around. Okay? So namely, I'm going to find all the elements that are less than 10, ding, ding, and ding, and put them in the array to the left of, okay, um, to the left, all the elements that are greater than 10, put them to the right in some order, and then put n in between them. Okay? That's my basic operation in quicksort. Pick an element that I'm going to call the pivot, and then partition the elements who's less than it, who's bigger than it. Okay? Any questions about that? What the basic operation is? How much time? Well, let us think about it. What is interesting about where the pivot ends up? This is actually going to be one of the things that we're going to need to know about. What is interesting if we do it? If we pick 10 as our pivot, and we put all the elements less than it to the left and all the elements to the right of it 
greater than it to the right. What is interesting about where the pivot ends up? You say in the middle, you say it's almost in the middle. The answer is not necessarily. Well, I'm not going to know whether it helps me much, okay? The question is, what, ha what does it do, okay? So someone could imagine, you know, I can see somebody doing calisthenics over there. It's not helping me much, but they're, they're doing calisthenics. That's good, right? The question is, what is the operational property that we want done, okay? Suppose I pivot the thing. What is interesting? What do I know is going to happen about the pivot element? Yes. The pivot element ends up in the right place. This is the interesting thing about pivoting. Okay, there are going to be two interesting things about this partitioning step. The important thing is that the pivot element ends up where it should end up. Namely, if I am fourth ultimately in sorted order, why am I fourth in sorted order? It's because there's three guys who happen to be before me in sorted order. Does everybody agree with that? Who are the guys who are before me in sorted order? The guys that are less than me. Does everybody agree with that? So the interesting thing is that after I partition the array, the pivot element ends up in the right spot. OK? Any questions about that? So if I do one of these pivoting steps, partitioning steps, have I sorted the array? No. One guy is sorted. OK? That's good. OK? But other than that, well, I've made some other progress, as we'll see. OK? Any questions about that? So conceptually, do you see about this operation of pivoting and part picking up pivot element and partitioning? How much time does it take to partition, to do one of these partitioning steps? OK? I hear O of n being tossed around. This is not so obvious to me. Give me an algorithm. Let's take a look at this thing. Let's try to work out an algorithm for this. 4, 7, 19, 3, 2, uh, 4. How can I take this array and partition it? Can anyone give me a way to do it? OK, that's clearly simple and clearly linear. What if, what if let's say, I'm allowed to use extra memory? Let's just try to think about it simply, first of all. Suppose I'm allowed to use extra memory. Can someone think of an extra of a way to pivot this partition this thing easily? So one thing I could do is have a small st a, a, a less than stack and a greater than stack. Does everybody agree with this? And as I go through this thing, here's my partition element, pivot element. Are you greater than my pivot element? Put, push you on five. Are you greater than my pivot element? Push it there. Push it there. No, you're less than it. Push it there. Push it there. Does everybody agree that in linear time, it takes constant time to push things on a stack? Does everybody see that? Now what would I do to fill up the array then? Now that I have them on the stack, what would your algorithm be? While the, the smaller one is not empty, pop, pop. Now it's empty, right? I've written those two. Now goes the pivot element. Copy the pivot element over into its proper position in the world, right? Now pop, 19, pop, 7, pop, 5. Any questions about that? Do people agree that this version of partition is linear? This is what everybody should see, OK? This is not very tricky, right? It's because we know about stacks. We can push and pop constant time, right? All the intricacies of how I'm diddling with the pointers and stuff, it's abstracted below it. That's why I like to think about data structures in an abstract way, right? Any questions about that? Is it, so this takes linear time to partition the element. Is this a good way to do it? Or what's the problem with doing it this way? 
Well, you say too slow. By definition, it can't be too slow. If I have n elements and I want to partition them, what is the, the, the absolute fastest? Let's say God was doing the partitioning, right? God is going to have to look at every element and do something with every element to partition it. Does everybody agree with that? You've got to actually physically do something with everything there. You can't say, I'm not going to look at this part of the array, and I'm going to partition it. Right? Does everybody agree with that? So just to look at the element is going to take linear time, right? The fact that I can do it in linear time tells me it's not too slow, right? I can do it as fast as you might could possibly dream of doing it, OK? So what's the problem? I am using too much memory. Maybe there's a way I could do this without extra memory. People see that? OK? So there is a slightly trickier way to do this without using extra memory, OK? But does everybody see, first of all, that on an abstract level, we don't need any tricky way, right? Any questions about it? OK? Now, how can we do it in a tricky way? Any questions about this? So it's clear I can do the partitioning in linear time, OK? In fact, I can do it in linear time um, in a somewhat cleverer way by um, by doing swaps, and that's what you, where you want to do it, OK? Suppose here is my pivot element, 10. Here is 7, 3, 19, 21, 4, 2. What can I do? I can ask myself, I'm going to keep track of who is less than the pivot, and keep the people who are less than the pivot on this end. And the people who are greater than the pivot, I'm going to keep them on the other end, right? 7. Is 7 less than the pivot? It's happy where it is, right? 3. Oops. You know what that means. 3. Is 3 less than the pivot? OK. Is it happy where it is? Yes. Is 19 less than the pivot? Not happy where it is, right? Is 2? This is a side that's greater than the pivot, right? Is two ha bigger than it than where what it should be, bigger than the pivot or smaller? How would two be made happy and this element made happy? Swap two with nineteen. This guy is now happy, right? These guys are all happy. Let's keep marching in. Are you less than the pivot? No. Are you greater than the pivot? Are you less than the pivot? Yes. Both of these guys are unhappy, right? How can we make them happier? Does everybody agree with that? Are we now done? We seemingly have run out of elements. Are we done? Is everybody put away? Who's unhappy now? Pivot's unhappy. How do we make the pivot happy? Switch it with who? The first guy that is on the big side, right? Does everybody agree with that? Everybody's now happy, right? This clearly is linear too, if you think about it, right? Does everybody agree with that? Comparing each element, occasionally stopping and doing a swap, right? And then each element is sort of moved at most once, OK? Any questions about that? Linear. And this I can still do in my array. OK? Question. Well, what complexity is that? Let's stop and think about it. Again, if you looked at the, in, in the book, I give you the code for this. OK? I didn't put it out on the slide. But let's think what it has to be. 4i goes from 1 to n. What am I doing? Marching over here, occasionally stopping. Right? Marching over here, occasionally stopping. When I have stopped, I am now going to do a swap, right? And now everybody I have looked at before, I never need to look at them again, right? So I spent linear time up to the swap. I have taken care of a linear number of elements. And now I'm just going to move on and keep going. In constant time, I'm going to, for every time, either move a boundary over 
or realize I've got somebody that's got to move, right? In constant time, I'm making progress. I have n steps of progress I have to make. That's why it's order n. Any questions? You can't see that? How would you show it's order n? You look at my program. And then I think if you look at the program, you should be able to see that why it's order n. Any questions about that? So partitioning is clearly an order n operation. Does everybody see that? Any questions about it? So the interesting thing about partitioning is Two, there are two interesting things about one of these pivoting operations, these partitioning operations. One we talked about. The pivot is going to end up in the right final sorted order, right? So after we have done a partitioning, the pivot is sitting comfortably where it will belong in sorted order, right? What is the other great thing about partitioning? Okay. I claim, is it ever going to be the case in sorted order that any of these guys belong over here? Could it be the case that any of these guys, why can't any of these guys belong over there? Because we partitioned it, what does that mean in, in another language? Okay? I say this joint, I think the way I think about it is all of these guys. If this guy is in the right spot, right, and this guy is, you know, has a value of x, if somebody is less than x, it's got to be to the left of it, right? So all the guys to the left of it are over here. In sorted order, they will stay to the left of x, right? All the guys that are bigger than x are to the right of x. They will all stay to the right of x afterwards. Okay? Does everybody see that? How many people see that? Okay, any questions about that? So what is important about that? The important thing is that we have now divided our problem into two jobs, each of which could be done independently. Let's say that I have a bunch, you guys are sorting. I have a bunch of exams here I want to sort. What could I do? I could say, pick out one of the papers. Say it's, who is it? It's Monroe, OK? Put all the papers to the, that, that, are, that are less than Monroe in alphabetical order. Throw them on that side of the table. Take all the elements on the right that are greater than Monroe, all their exams. Put them on the, on the right side. Then I take two of you. I say, you sort these, and you sort those. You guys could sort these papers independently and not step on each other. Does everybody agree with that? You would sort all the ones that are less than this. They would get written back over here. You would sort all the ones greater than this, get, put them over here. I have two independent sorting jobs. Does everybody see that? And this gives me now a recursive algorithm. What is my recursive algorithm? OK? Basically, in order to sort, my key step is I'm going to sort from the lowth element to the height element. So long as there is more than one element in my subarray to be sorted, pick a pivot element and tell me, partition the array, telling me where the pivot ends up, right? Now I know after this partitioning, the pivot is here. You've told me where it is. It's sitting over there. These guys are all less than the pivot. These guys are all greater than it. Now quick sort from the beginning, the low th first element, to the pivot location minus 1. Then sort from the pivot locations plus 1 to the end. Does everybody see this is a recursive sorting algorithm? Basically, to sort the quick sort, I quick sort the whole thing by partitioning to break the array into two smaller chunks and then quick sorting each chunk. 
That is quicksort. Any questions about that? Questions? Well, now you're asking me about what the, uh, okay, so you're saying if the pivot element was always the first element, this is selection sort, right? So let's say that, that the way you write a, we'll call it maybe a psycho partition algorithm, psycho because you're crazy, okay? You go through and in linear time, find out which is the smallest one, right? In the subarray, you could figure that in linear time, right? Return, hey, use this as a pivot, okay? And now what would happen? That element would sit comfortably in the first spot in the array, right? How much stuff is to be done to the left of it? Nothing. The job's good. This part of the recursive call is going to return quick, right? This one, on the other hand, still has a lot of work to do, okay? Any questions about that? So you, in some sense, this could do what selection sort would do. If you magically always do guarantee yourself you're going to pick the worst possible pivot. Okay? Any questions about it? Okay, now the, the hope here, the vision is maybe we can do better. Okay? Any questions about that? Suppose instead of psycho as in crazy, we have psycho as in can see into the future. Okay? What would the person want to pick as a pivot? The median element, the one that is going to belong in the middle, right? And why is that going to be great? Okay, because now I have split my problem into two halves. The best way to balance the work is to split it into two equal halves. So if I can be psycho clairvoyant, okay, then quick sort will clearly be good. Okay, and I guess next class we'll figure out which kind of psychos, okay, dominate the world. Okay, any questions about that? Any questions? Okay, thanks. This is probably where I should end. Thank you.